In 2017, I was in line to see Dunkirk with my friend Luke, and he told me a story that struck me as really absurd. He said that one of his coworkers had wanted to watch a movie with him, and he expressed this by saying, quote, we should go see an A24 movie sometime. We both had a good laugh at this because, like, who talks like that? At the time, it was like if someone said, oh, let's go see the new Universal movie or the new Paramount Pictures movie. But in less than a month, I had a friend say the exact same thing to me. And before long, being distributed by A24 was almost as much of a marketing point as any of a movie's actors, their director, or their screenwriter. Even for people who wouldn't have considered themselves particularly interested in independent film before. Around the same time, Letterboxd, a website and app allowing users to log and rate every movie that they see, started to gain popularity. And I'm not really able to empirically back this up, but I felt both these things be part of a change in the willingness of people around me to seek out small and weird movies, either because they trusted a distributor or so they could log a movie on Letterboxd or be part of discourse around it online. And whatever criticisms there are of A24 and whatever jokes there are to be made at the expense of Letterboxd users, this has been a positive change. And across an entertainment industry where mid-budget projects are going out of existence, and high-budget projects are almost exclusively part of pre-existing intellectual property, I want to take a second to appreciate this trend in popularity of independent film, because I'm just old enough to remember a time before it. Being in your 20s is weird because you're young enough that most of the population will make fun of you for calling yourself old, but you're old enough that you start to encounter adults that are a decade younger than you, and I think a lot is different for teenagers and young adults getting into film now or in recent years than it was for me. I first got really interested in film film in the beginning of 2012 as a 15-year-old with a really bad case of the flu, and I decided I was going to watch a lot of the Oscar nominees from previous years I hadn't been allowed to see at the time. So I watched movies like No Country for Old Men, There Will Be Blood, and Michael Clayton. Okay, mostly movies from 2007. That was a really good year. And I was so energized by them that after I was no longer sick, I became interested in seeing other films from those directors. And I was interested in seeing some of the movies that were already getting Oscar buzz for the next year. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that route of getting into independent movies movies, but it did lead me to see a lot of stuff I never would have watched before. Beasts of the Southern Wild, Moonrise Kingdom, The Sessions, Amore, which I was definitely too young to appreciate. And it's hard because I was younger. Naturally, most 15-year-olds weren't this type of weird. But the conversations I saw happening online with people of all ages, excluding those being had by professional critics from a paper, or website, or magazine, felt different. For one, logging your movie watching in the way that Letterboxd encourages was not as common. Back then, you could use IMDb to do pretty much all the same things, it just never got as popular. Maybe this had to do with the age I was at the time, but I just don't remember people talking about what distributor or studio a movie came from as much. At the time, Blumhouse wasn't nearly as big as it is now. Annapurna was just a couple years old, A24 was in its infancy, and Neon wouldn't exist for several years. And still, I don't remember a lot of buzz about what new films Magnolia Pictures had picked up, even though they had a pretty good output at the time. It was much more common to hear something described as a Sundance Film Festival film, or a Cannes Film Festival film. If you've only ever seen that word, written, you don't pronounce the S, it's just can. And yes, these are more just changes that make me feel old to remember, rather than seismic shifts in media consumption. But I think a hobbyist interest both in smaller films and in looking at the technical aspects of movies and the deeper themes they're trying to explore has really increased since then. And okay, even if I'm just observing the increase in interest among my friends as I became an older person and sought out people that had the same interests as me, I feel really confident in saying things have changed for the better on YouTube specifically. By and large, the most popular form of engagement with film on YouTube was akin to a consumer review. Someone speaking off the cuff about a movie they had just seen in front of either a green screen or a collection of Blu-rays and action figures. Now, this is not to rag on those people. With limited time off and money, it's nice to have someone give you a good idea of whether you're going to enjoy a movie. But as fully admitted by many of these creators, the intention was not to make deep analyses of a movie or the techniques that went into making it, and skewed hard towards coverage of big studio movies. What was missing was longer considered reflections on film, and attention paid to great smaller movies that could benefit from the extra buzz. And that's where things have changed. There's a lot of things to reflect on with the explosion of video essays, 
because uh, speaking is one, people that are inclined to make YouTube videos have a lot they wanna say, and there's not a huge incentive to edit things down because a lot of people put YouTube videos on in the background while they're cooking or at the gym or playing a video game that doesn't demand their full attention. So there's an appeal to a longer video where you get to procrastinate on choosing what to watch next for two hours. And you wind up with a lot of videos that are longer than they need to be. I'm going to explore why SpongeBob is, uh, you know, a really good show. Part one. Early cinema. There's also a tendency, which I'm worried I've fallen prey to, to start replicating idiosyncrasies and ticks of more popular content creators that comes off really unnatural and grating if you watch a lot of stuff in the same genre. And then there's content that's plagiarized, flatly incorrect, or just a summation of a Wikipedia article. But despite all of that, this content still often requires somebody to spend time thinking about what they're going to say, writing multiple drafts of a script, maybe even running it by other people in their life to come to really detailed reflections on the media they consume. And doing this for smaller, artsy movies as much, if not more, than large studio films. And of course, there were people doing this kind of stuff when I was a teenager. Just of the ones I remember, Every Frame of Painting started off about 10 years ago as the gold standard for video essays about movies. One of the reasons I like filmmaking is that sometimes you have to design a solution to a particular stumbling block. For example, how do you show a text message in a film? Around the same time, Cinefix was functioning as watch mojo for people that went to film school. Counting down to number three, we have to hand it to David Mycod's Australian dystopian drama, The Rover, a kind of quieter, more meditative Mad Max with far less leather. A few years later, Patrick Willem's Folding Ideas and Nerdwriter all started making video essays. Even before this, a smaller channel called Movies I Love and So Can You popped up, doing a really great series on his favorite movies. What the film works best as is a detective noir story. But these channels were exceptional when they started, and I think it's for the better that they're now closer to the norm. You can look up most movies you've seen and find someone making a really high effort video about why it impacted them. And while it's easy to get lost in overlong videos or those that you don't particularly think are that good, I wanna take a moment of reflection to appreciate that so many people are both trying and succeeding in making that type of video. One last bit, I know I've had times where I've watched a video and gotten to the end of it, really enjoyed it, and just kind of click away to something else and never find that channel again. So if you're having that kind of experience right now, just gonna nudge towards um, give me a subscription, maybe like in the video. This is unfortunately a consistently kind of annoying part of YouTube. So thanks for bearing with me through it and being in the very small percentage of people that sticks around to the end. Thanks for watching, have a wonderful Wednesday.